Good morning. Uh, the title of my talk is, in fact, Features of Macams, and you have seen some slides from that. And I had been talking time to time uh, during my comments to other uh, speeches. Uh, so, so I think you are already familiar to some of the content. So uh, let me start uh, by commenting um, uh, on what we, what we do and what we do not try to do. Uh, now, first of all, um, we have seen in the concert yesterday, the, the musicians were, were talking about some rules, some methods in improvising or uh, in a piece to g give the feeling of a, a makam. But they didn't talk about much about the feeling, really. They didn't talk about the musical content that is perceived. So they, uh, in fact, uh, each makam has its own character. And if you would talk for a long time to the musicians, they would explain you indirectly about this content, this musical content. It gives that, it evokes this kind of a feeling, that kind of a feeling. So in fact, the target is to be able to transfer that feeling. So these rules of progression or so are just methods they use uh, as a means. But, but they sh this shouldn't reflect uh, all what Macam is. I mean, wh when we talk about features, we, d we do not try to say this is all about Macam. So it's, uh, uh, it's, it's an art, and it's supposed to give a f feeling, transfer a feeling. And these are just means they use. And the, the other things they use, maybe they cannot utter. They cannot explain. So they learn from each other. They learn from the masters. Uh, so the mood, the, the feeling, is another issue. Uh, it's, it's an important issue, but it's not among my goal uh, in this presentation. Here, the goal is to um, find some new features that haven't been used in the past uh, to start studying Macam music, to start asking more questions. Uh, because making uh, uh, errors also helps us understand many things. So trying to find out, uh, well, define a feature and see that it doesn't work for classification is another means of understanding the music. Uh, so if we look at the international literature uh, and try to gather what's common there about Macam in, in a large geographical area, you would see that they would speak about uh, intervallic structure and scale and pitch hierarchy. That means some of the notes inside the scale would be more important for the makam. So yesterday's examples were given one scale. Uh, in one makam, the emphasis notes were, let's say, the second, the third, the fourth. In another makam, that would be the fifth, the fourth. So th there is some kind of hierarchy of emphasis, let's say. Uh, and then there is a melodic direction, and the melodic direction would explain you how you move from one emphasis note or a central note to another. And uh, that those melodic uh, direction is an overall direction. It's not too local. You shouldn't consider it uh, something that defines small melodies. It's more a central tone, and you can play many things around it to uh, give that feeling. So you should play it in a way to give that feeling. And it's, so the master would advise you to stay around that emphasis note. Then it would give the feeling. So it's that kind of uh, process. Uh, and uh, makam uh, is usually considered to be in between, uh, let's say, the scale type and fixed tune. So in the scale type, you would have a scale and the tonic. And you can play anything. You don't need to emphasize this note or that note. And uh, you can play anything. And uh, in, in Daskia, uh, Daskia is a term from Iranian music, you would have something close to a fixed tune. And you would uh, change this tune almost. So there is maybe all something like a fixed phrase, a fixed uh, piece. And you, you would embellish that you would make improvisations based on that. Uh, so Macam would stand somewhere in between. Oh, I should better use this. 
So if we look at the features defined in Turkish music theory, so uh, if you open a theory book, you would see one or two pages for each makam. And in these two pages, they would first uh, name the scale, well, explain the scale, which frets they use, uh, their intervals. If some of the uh, specific notes have specific intonations, like they would say uh, in makam ushak, the note segya would, should be played lower than uh, indicated on the notation. So they would explain that. Uh, and then they would explain an overall melodic progression. Uh, and most of the time, they would classify it into three different classes. Uh, well, ascending, descending, ascending, descending is the third class. Uh, we will see that. There are some typical phrases, but uh, when I talk to masters uh, and ask them to show me some examples, they, they show a few. Uh, and they sometimes say, uh, well, it's more about the overall melodic progression. Not exactly the typical phrase. Uh, but there are typical phrases. I mean, they, you would spot them. But their function is not maybe like uh, in ragas. Um, so it's possible, without using any typical phrase, to give that feeling to, to improvise in that makam, if you follow the melodic direction. Uh, there is always some explanation about tonic, dominant, leading tone, etc. The, these provide some information, but sometimes are mi misleading also. There are some discussions going on about the definition of dominant. So some people say it's the starting point. So the, the progression starts with the first emphasis, not that is the dominant. Some people would say it's just the, uh, the, the tone that's in between the tetrachord and pentachord relation, just the middle note. Sometimes they coincide, sometimes they do not coincide, these two information. Then there would, they would argue uh, if what's the definition of a dominant. But it seems that it's a Western terminology introduced, and it's not, the, the, the current meaning is not settled down. There are some discussions about that. Uh, again, in those definitions, you would find descriptions about melodic range. So they would say, OK, this makam uses the low register. And when extended, it would be extended toward low regions. So uh, they would specify uh, with loose words some range, melodic range. And also they would talk about typical modulations or flavors, we say. So in a certain makam, you, uh, you would expect to uh, play certain flavors uh, you, after the interlude. So in the interlude, you would first uh, really introduce the makam itself. After that, you can go make some transitions to put some more color. And uh, there are typical modulations. And uh, also, they specify sometimes for some makams that the octave relation of the notes do not hold. Like uh, in makam sabah, uh, they would say the higher tonic is not played, but it's modified. So the scale is not defined for one octave and just repeat it. So it's a scale definition throughout all the range. And you may have different notes on higher or lower registers. And we have musicians here. So if I make an, if I make an error, please correct me. OK? Take the freedom to correct me if you find something wrong. Now, uh, well, now you all know that there are uh, makams that use the same scale. So uh, in theory books, this blue note in the middle that is linking the tetrachord and pentachord is named as dominant, this, but this is in discussion. Uh, so for example, uh, no, OK, let's continue. Now, we have been using pitch histograms. Uh, it provides some information, overall information, about what's emphasized. I think the, the main idea of using pitch histograms comes from there. You, are, you have a scale, and some notes are emphasized. That means they would show up with higher frequencies. That's the reason pitch histogram can be used to some level for uh, classification. But there are problems with it, because emphasis is important, but sometimes Duration is misleading because, I mean, the musician could just uh, stay on a note.
for some time, and is it really meaningful for that specific makam? Maybe not always. Uh, and when we compare pitch histograms, uh, there are certain regions of the pitch histogram we compute a distance, and maybe there's no reason to compute a distance there. They are formed by glides or so. Uh, so defining a good dif distance measure is difficult on pitch histograms. Uh, and also, uh, you know, there, there is some freedom uh, for the musician to play some of the pitches a little bit lower or a little bit higher. And that is, a, again, another problem in distance uh, definition. So if another musician could play a little bit lower and it's acceptable, uh, this cre well, in the pitch histogram, this creates high, high distance, but we need to tolerate that. And uh, you see that some of the peaks have large width. Uh, this may mean uh, there have been vibrators around it. Or this may mean that that pitch uh, changes its location uh, during the melodic progression. So uh, for the second case, it's important for Macam. Uh, but for the first case, vibrato uh, can be played anywhere. So uh, that may be confusing. So uh, yeah, it's informative to use pitch histograms, but it's just, it's just a starting point, uh, and we find we want to f uh, find new ways of using it. So the main problem, let's summarize it, is finding a musicological uh, meaningful distance measure based on pitch histograms. Now, uh, similar to pitch histograms, matching. Uh, yesterday we have seen an engram-based Macam classifier. That's like a pitch histogram matching in a way, intervallic matching. Uh, and uh, there we would see that some of the Macams are confused a lot. Uh, Erdem has talked about that. So it's the Hussein, Husseini, Ushak Bayati, uh, and Muhayyer, they get confused. These are the um, Macams that use the same scale or very close scales. Uh, first of all, uh, to start with looking for, for new features, in fact, this pitch histogram can be used. Uh, can be reduced to a lower dimensional um, feature vector. Uh, if, if you know what's important, you can just pick some information. For example, this, uh, we were talking about Husseini and Mohayer being confused. Uh, but I know that in Mohayer and Husseini, there are different emphasis notes also. The, in Mohayer, the pitch Mohayer would be emphasized more. In Husseini, Husseini would be emphasized more. So if I know that information, I would just maybe take uh, the frequency from the pitch histogram, only that information. And if I would take, you see, you see this figure, re the relative frequencies of only three pitches. So I take Neva, Husseini, and Mohayer, and plot this on a, a 3D plot. You would see that Husseini and Mohayer can be separated. If I would try to do it on the whole pitch histogram, I would confuse it more. If I would just choose some pitches, I would be able to separate it more easily. So there is some potential to get uh, reduced but more effective uh, feature sets from pitch histograms. Let's go to uh, measuring melodic progression. Up to this point, I have never seen any computational analysis of melodic progression, any figure any formulation, well, uh, just uh, a few trials, uh, formulations, but no one has shown that it works on, on data, for example, or uh, no one has shown on large amount of data what's the output. So what I did uh, is, first, I have taken the symbolic database uh, and uh, created a melodic um, contour from this information, downsampled all of that, maybe I, I should be fast. Uh, and sum them up to get an overall melodic progression. So you see what the dots here. Okay, this is the time axis, and this is the pitch axis, and all the dots come from pieces. So here many pieces. So you would have one piece, one dot here, one dot here, and it's it has continuation like that. Uh, and if you would 
uh, get the average of all, you would see that Muhayyar have this kind of a progression and Husseini this kind of a progression. And uh, uh, the main difference seems to be really at the beginnings. So one starts at a higher point and one starts on a mid-range, mid uh, emphasizing the beginning note. This is the note Husseini and this is the note Muhayyar and this appears to be the main discriminating factor. Uh, so, as a feature, what can we use? Maybe the slope of this curve, uh, or just the beginning, if they have the same final. Or, uh, well, to be more robust, maybe we can add all the intervals, and the sum would be a minus uh, if it uh, has a larger slope. If it's going up, then it would have a plus sign. So, sum of all the deltas could be a feature, a very simple feature of the melodic progression. So, uh, as I said, the starting index, uh, oh, somehow this doesn't work, starting index can be a feature and some of deltas can be a feature. And if we would put plot it on these two dimensional surfaces, uh, Husseini and Muhayyar seems to be uh, separable oh, again. And uh, let's look at the three main types of progressions, melodic progressions. So ascending, ascending, descending, and descending. So these are the three types you would see uh, in theory books when they explain my comps. If you get the averages, this is the overall picture we see. So when they talk about ascending, uh, the progression starts with, uh, in the tonic, and it goes to higher registers, and of course it has to come back to the tonic. If they are talking about ascending, descending, or mid-range progression, they say, it would start somewhere in the middle, uh, ascend a bit, and then come back to the tonic. And for descending, you, you get this figure starting from the top high register, going down to the tonic. And this is the first time we observe, observe it on actual data. So it's always on words. And it's, uh, perceiving it is not that easy. I don't know, maybe you have tried yesterday. If everything they explain, you can hear it or not, it's not always so clear. But uh, I don't know, I find it easy uh, on seeing it on the figures. Uh, let's see on audio, audio data. The previous ones were uh, on symbolic data. So uh, each one is from an improvisation. The pitch data, time and pitch. So you would see in Ushak, uh, the, the melody progresses, well, as ascending, and then goes back to the tonic. In Husseini, it starts in the mid-range, mid goes to tonic, and, but goes back to the high, and then goes to the tonic. And in Muhayyar, it would start in the high register and go down progressively to the tonic. These are the three classes. And can we kind of find a way to measure it? So because we want to measure it. Uh, if we look at some averages uh, on this, I mean, if I would get this pitch data and plot some averages of window data, you would get this kind of a plot. Uh, well, for this uh, descending, uh, it's usually you get some figures like this, but uh, the mid-range progressions and ascending progressions are most of the time confusing, so we need to do some work on that, uh, analyzing the me overall melodic progression of the audio data. Uh, and even if you, ha if you can, let's say, this, um, measure features about scale and features about melodic progression, there will be some confusion, because there are macams which use the same scale and the same overall melodic progression but then the musicians would, would say they rest on some different points, some different notes. So that was the answer given by Okan Murat yesterday. Uh, so I find this type of work interesting because before they would never tell you about that. I mean, if, if you ask them to tell about Tahir, uh, they wouldn't tell you where it rests, but they would tell you, okay, it starts on a high register, it goes down, it, it's, this is the scale, blah, blah, but uh, they wouldn't talk to you about that feature. Once you uh, show them the example that you have two macams, and in their definitions, it, they have all the same features, then they start giving you more information about it. 
uh, and uh, this is the extra information, the resting points. So uh, now I see my target as, um, well, we, we need to concentrate on melodies and find out these uh, centers, central tones, and how they progress. Uh, because it seems that uh, that is the uh, main issue about the Makam. Uh, do I have time? I don't know. Sorry. Finished? Finished. OK. So uh, I, I just say, OK, let's also look at the melodic range. So since they specify it in theoretical books, uh, for example, for Rust and Mahur, if we would plot the melodic range is this dimension. And this is the mean of the melodic progression. So well, you, you, may, be, you may have this uh, much of a melodic range, but it can be on a higher register, on a lower register. To measure that, I measure the mean. So the mean appears uh, on the y-axis, and the range appears on the x-axis. It seems most of the time range doesn't help us to discriminate macams, but the mean, the location uh, of this melodic range uh, is uh, useful. Uh, well, there, there is always some me mentioning about tetrachords and pen pentachords and defining scales using tetrachords and pentachords. When I talk to masters, some would agree that they are really important. They define the flavors, the Chechnys. Some would say these are um, artificial formulations of a scale. A scale well, Makam is composed of a whole scale uh, and some melodic progression. These divisions doesn't have a meaning. Uh, do we need to detect this dominant? Uh, well, that can be a feature, but not the most discriminating feature, maybe. Uh, we can measure that, maybe. So the, our future goal is really going to segmentation of these melodies and finding these uh, emphasis notes uh, or central notes. Uh, and we will collect data about this soon. Uh, and also, we want to uh, segment the piece into makams or flavors and chechnies. Uh, that's really important. Uh, and we will be always using this way of testing these features in, in a makam recognition task, where the, our real aim is not the makam recognition, but to understand makam. That's all about my talk. Thank you for listening. <laughs>